Hey Gears Hackers, I'm Nick. Over the last few years on YouTube, I've been pretty vocal about what I think about Apple as a company and I'm, how I'm just not a fan of their business practices. Hear me out though. This isn't to say they don't have some interesting products. For instance, I use AirPods Pro when I'm building PCs and to listen to music too and to answer phone calls on my Xiaomi phone because they are the best tool for the job. Given I didn't buy them and they're expensive, they're actually a pretty nice gift, but that's besides the point. They're properly good. Now, I just don't like the way Apple does business, that all aside. I promised myself that I would never buy another Apple product, but I found myself in a little bit of a situation where my curiosity about these new M1 Macs was just way too much to ignore. And I committed the cardinal PC sin of pre-ordering a base model M1 Mac Mini, and it arrived on launch day. Unlike a lot of the other videos you've seen about these M1 Macs, I've actually been using it to see if it's something I can recommend to people who kind of need a computer that can do computery things, not gaming, but regular computer related tasks. Sometimes it just doesn't need to be technical, it just needs to make sense. There's a huge caveat to this video though. I've been daily driving this Apple Silicon Mac Mini for about a week and I've been using it to do everything on a daily basis that doesn't include our video editing workflow and gaming. I've tested all of that, but this video is really from a PC user's perspective about usability and it's not about gaming. Okay, let's have a little bit of a, let's call it a history lesson, right? And this is my own Mac history lesson. I'm a bit of a Mac tragic and I've, I've been a PC user forever, but I've also been using Macs for a very long time as well. I've owned a lot of Macs. Some of them include like a Beige G3 desktop, a G3 Power Mac, a G4 Mac Mini, a G4 Power Mac, a Quicksilver G4 Power Mac, a dual G5 Power Mac, a G4 Emac, a 2006 or 2007 black Intel MacBook, a 2008 Intel iMac, a 2009 MacBook Pro. You get the idea, right? It's a lot of Macs and it's a lot of PowerPC and Intel Macs. In fact, I've still got a bunch of them. Anyways, I always found that PowerPC Macs were always just more interesting to me since they truly used an alternate architecture. So when they switched to x86, I lost interest because I could just build a Hackintosh and that Hackintosh was more powerful than any Mac on the market. So it was kind of pointless to own an Intel Mac. That is until now. When Apple announced that they would be transitioning to an ARM-based architecture called Apple Silicon, I was confused, but I also understand why they do such a thing. Intel just isn't making anything interesting right now. And that's not to say that they won't make anything interesting in the future, but for the last few years, and all the PC users have to agree, it's been pretty stagnant. And to kind of end the story time section, when they said they were doing this transition and they were jumping to ARM, I had to actually honestly and truthfully suppress my excitement. And I told you, I'm a Mac tragic. They were doing it again, a transition to another architecture. I've seen it happen so many times, all the way from 68K to PowerPC to x86, and now onto ARM. As I mentioned earlier, I bought the base model M1 Mac mini with eight gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage to see if even the cheapest M1 Mac was up to the task of doing things that Apple had claimed. And this is really gonna surprise you and it's really going to take the wind out of the sails of all of those PC users. So let's take a quick look at the M1 Mac mini. It's similar to the Intel Mac Minis in design. It's 19.7 centimeters squared with a height of 3.6 centimeters and it weighs around 1.2 kilograms. And all the Imperial measurements are on screen for you guys now as well. On the rear, there's a power button. There's a figure eight power connector, gigabit ethernet, two USB type C slash Thunderbolt three ports, an HDMI 2.0 port and two USB type A ports. It also supports up to three displays using a combination of the type C ports and the HDMI port. I'm actually using a type C to display port adapter that I picked up off Amazon for about 15 bucks. It's also got Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0 built in as well. With all that said, let's jump in and check out the benchmarks. 
If you're new here, and I suspect you will be new here, this is how we do benchmarks on the channel. Traditionally, we use a collection of GPU-based benchmarks, but since only one of them actually runs properly, we can only do Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Basically, all of the figures that you're seeing here are compared to our regular GPU and CPU-based benchmarking systems. So I hope that gives you a little bit more context into how we do this. Let's get into it, and I hope this isn't too confusing. And just remember, we're only just scratching the surface with these benchmarks. That's kind of the point of it. I've got some other stuff that I want to run, like door bench and some more audio-based benchmarks in another video. I just didn't want this video to go for like an hour or something like that. So yeah, let's get into the first benchmark, Cinebench R23. Let's start off with Cinebench R23 and really take a look at the benchmark everybody wants to see the single core score. Since Apple did claim that they had the fastest core ever made on a CPU. And as you can see, that is actually not the case at all. Also be aware that although people would like to compare these new M1 chips to mobile CPUs and to laptop systems, Apple's actually marketing this as a desktop CPU, not a mobile CPU. The only difference that we're really seeing is the performance per watt, which on the M1 is absolutely phenomenal. It's almost unrivaled at this point in time. If we look at the multi-threaded score in Cinebench R23, we're seeing that on the pool of CPUs that we've tested with R23, remember these are all CPUs that we have on hand that we retested for the purposes of this video and future videos as well. We can see that the Apple Silicon M1 is one of the slower eight core CPUs in multi-threaded applications. And the reason why it's slower than other eight core CPUs is this is not truly an eight core CPU. In Cinebench, although it does say it's an 8-core CPU, it only reports the multi-core multiplier as being 5 times, not 8 times. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Now, I had to use some older GPUs that I had that we have previously tested to make this make sense and have a little bit more context. Anything else that we've tested recently far outperforms the M1. So as we can see, it's about five frames faster than a NVIDIA GTX 960M on my Dell XPS 9550, which is a mobile version of an old GPU. Uh, it's also a little bit slower than a regular 960, which is actually quite a good comparison for this. So if we had a 1050 or a 1050 Ti to test, we probably would have done that as well. And for the sakes of science, I did it like our regular GPU benchmarks with 1080p, 1440p and 4K. I was just curious to see how this would perform. And then as you can see with the M1 GPU, the frame rate isn't that good. However, this is Apple's first outing for a desktop GPU. Although it's kind of like integrated GPU levels, I think it's pretty impressive for a first outing, I'm not gonna lie. And lastly, onto 4K, we're seeing that the frame rate is obviously not that impressive, but again, the fact that it can render seven frames per second at 4K from a company that's never made a GPU before, uh, I, I, I think that if this is any indication of how quickly and how rapidly they could develop GPUs, that, to be honest, in a few years' time, these numbers are going to look a whole lot different. Also remember that we're using the Metal API for all of this testing as opposed to DX12 with the rest of the benchmarks in these graphs. So although we are seeing some accurate-ish numbers, the APIs that are being used are completely different. So they can't be used as a direct comparison. Lastly, onto our Adobe Media Encoder and Premiere Pro benchmark project. Now we've set up this project quite a while ago and we retest this periodically. So this is a benchmark that we use to test GPU hardware acceleration on every new GPU that we get through. As you can see right now, the M1 Mac Mini is not that impressive. Uh, to render a two and a half minute clip, it does take quite a while, but again, the fact that it works with Rosetta and allows us to use hardware rendering at all is still pretty impressive. We're only just at the start of this journey. I give it a year, 
and we're going to see some really, really interesting things from these new Apple Silicon chips. Benchmarks aside, the user experience is decent. And I know there's a lot of hate towards Big Sur and how it's become more and more like iOS, but you can't complain about something that's been happening for years now. It's become more and more incremental, but this time it's past the point of being incremental and it's more unified than it's ever been. Love it or hate it, it's here to stay. With saying that, I was pretty happy to see that the terminal app was still here. I know it's simple, but I use the terminal app a lot in macOS, and for some reason, on these new Apple Silicon Macs, I thought that they might remove it for some reason, but yes, it's still there. So people who have asked me about the terminal, it's still here, and it's here to stay, for now. One thing to take into account as well, I've seen a lot of mixed reports of people saying that eGPUs won't be detected or work with these Apple Silicon Macs. Now, I don't have an AMD based eGPU. I do have one to test. It does detect. And although people are saying that it isn't true Thunderbolt, the eGPU does detect without any issues. You just can't use it and it's not accelerated for now. As far as support for Adobe Creative Cloud applications, this is where it begins to get interesting. Photoshop and Lightroom run pretty averagely. However, for some weird reason, for me at least, Premiere Pro runs really well. In fact, I'm editing this video on the new M1 Mac to show you that even with Rosetta, there is no issue doing this at all. And surprisingly, it's pretty usable. That is until we need to render any projects. It's not very fast for that, at least not with Premiere. For now. The truth is, most of what we shoot is in Blackmagic RAW, and Blackmagic actually released an Apple Silicon version of the B RAW codec, and I have that installed on this machine, so I suspect that's why the performance is so good. As for DaVinci Resolve, uh, Resolve actually has an Apple Silicon beta, and it runs pretty well from what I've tested, but again, I'm not a Resolve user, and I'm just not going to comment on that. I'll leave that up to the Resolve users out there. The same goes for Final Cut. I don't like Final Cut, I won't touch it. And also I'm not spending $500 Aussie dollars on a program I'm never gonna use. It's just not my cup of tea. I don't like Final Cut. There's nothing you can do about it. Even from a PC user's perspective, where I daily drive a Threadripper that can render videos just like this one in about five minutes, sure, it takes a lot longer on an M1 Mac Mini, but the fact you can edit it all and using the amount of mixed codecs that we use is pretty impressive. Even with Premiere running under Rosetta, it's truly impressive. The downside is that Sure, Premiere runs well with Rosetta, but things like Chrome still struggle to play back video on YouTube. Obviously, this is gonna change when they make a native version, but for now, stick to Safari. And I can't believe those words are leaving my mouth. For now. The M1 Mac Mini kind of makes me feel like a dinosaur. And I didn't wanna feel this way about it, but the truth is, even with the cheapest M1 Mac, it is very competent. And I'm, I'm being honest here, I really didn't want to like it, but it's a solid computer for people who want enough power to edit videos and do non-gamer things on it. It's for someone who wants to buy a computer that they can plug into a monitor and a keyboard and mouse and just use it. It's simple, it's not overly complicated, and it just works. If the M1 Mac Mini is any indication of what's to come, I say bring it on. Like It's truly one of those moments where you feel like it's the first time you're using your computer because it's just that different. But at the same time, it's a familiar comforting feeling when you know this relatively cheap computer can do most things you throw at it, except for gaming, for now. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though, and I can live with a unified memory. I think it's actually a pretty cool concept. I like how it shares the memory between the CPU and GPU. What I think it's lacking is the option for RAM expansion, considering it uses LPDDR4. It could technically do it, but it doesn't. And I know the Mac users are gonna say that MacBooks have been this way for years, but I use a PC. Don't just accept that. It's not something you should have to get used to. What really surprised me was the M.2 expansion, or rather, the lack of expansion. They could have easily have done this. Now, I've watched teardowns of the M1 Mac Mini, and the case is basically empty. And I suspect they'll add this for, like, later power user-focused Apple Silicon Macs. Yeah, but for now, you're just going to have to use network storage or an external hard drive. But the option would have been really nice. 
If you did what I did and you bought the 256 gig version, after you install most of the programs that most people use, it only leaves you with around about 150 gigs of storage remaining, which for me is obviously different because I have all of the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite installed. But for people that this computer is actually aimed at, it's probably more than adequate. And you have to think about this as well. Apple is really pushing for iCloud storage. So this also makes sense for people who are buying at this price point which if you're interested in, is going for around 700 US dollars or around 1100 Aussie dollars at the time of filming this video. And knowing Apple, it's probably not gonna change from that. Now there's far too much to talk about about these new Apple Silicon Macs. And the truth is there's far more than I could ever talk about in a single video. And if you wanna see more content about this M1 Mac, drop a comment down below. But let us know what you think of these new Apple Silicon M1 Macs. I think they're pretty interesting and I'm kind of keen to see what the next generation brings because if this is anything to go by, I think Intel and AMD are gonna have to do something to fight back and at least in the mobile space. Like I don't see this being a full fat desktop replacement platform without little things like NVMe storage and also upgradable RAM for now. It's just a really interesting time for technology and I didn't think we'd see anything like this this year, but yeah, here we are. Now, if you got to this part of the video and you liked what I said so far, uh, this might just turn you off. And this is probably the part of the video that most people are gonna comment about. You've been warned, okay? Whew. You ready? The last thing I wanted to touch on is the whole marketing of these new Macs and people defending it. Look, I'll admit, Apple Silicon is good. It takes everything in my entire body and moral fiber to resist saying that. It's also very interesting, but it's truly got a long way to go to compete. The main issue I have with Apple Silicon is the fanboys. Those who looked at Apple's misleading graphs and took it as gospel. We all know Apple is a marketing machine and they wanna take your money. Geez, they even took my money for me to make this video. This isn't speculation, this is fact. Almost nothing in their marketing for these M1 Max has any basis on Apple anything. Even when you read the fine print on their website about their testing methodology, they're comparing things that simply do not make sense. Look really closely at the fine print. Look, I'm going to read this to you. Ready? Performance tests are conducted using specific computer systems and reflect the approximate performance of Mac Mini. What they're saying is, they're not using a production Mac Mini. In fact, they might not even be using an M1 for all of their testing at all. All they're saying is that it's a Mac Mini, right? They're also comparing as this to an Intel Mac Mini with half as many cores. They're also saying that speeds are based on theoretical throughput and may vary. Theoretical throughput? That's almost them admitting that they didn't test anything at all. Okay, so anyways, guys. Take everything that you see in this video and everything that you see from Apple with a grain of salt. And especially for the marketing and for the love of God, don't take the marketing as gospel. They're basically admitting that it's not all as it seems. Just read the fine print. And the argument could also be, at least they have fine print, it's still not as it seems, and that's not a good enough excuse. Don't let that take away from the truth though. The Apple Silicon M1 Mac Mini is a very competent computer and I like it. And that's a fact for now. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. If you hated the video, hit the dislike button twice. Yeah, I'm your boy Nick with Gear Seekers. You peak, we seek. And like aside from all that marketing stuff that all of these companies do, uh, they said a lot of misleading stuff with the marketing, which is another reason why I wanted to go out and buy this. It is a good computer and there's no denying that. I'm not saying it's not a good computer. I just don't like the way they advertise and market these computers to people who aren't tech savvy. It just doesn't make sense. Thanks for watching.